My name is Michael Contianjin. We've been in Houston since 1990, so that's 33 years.、Uh, and that's when Susan and I got married. And we've been married for 33 years, very happy. I have three kids, all born in Houston, all born in my hospital. And they're, they're wonderful kids, they're lovely. Sometimes they can be challenging. As kids can be, but but they they're just wonderful kids. I was born in Hong Kong in 1950, January. My my dad was Korean, my mom was Chinese. I was Chinese looking enough, even though I was mixed、uh, Korean and Chinese, that people just treated me as if I were Chinese. And since I did speak Chinese, Cantonese, that helped. Um, and so the issue never came up. It was only later in life that I had to deal with racial identities more. And because I uh, was uh, related to as as Chinese, I really felt very much part of the majority in Hong Kong. We lived on the second floor of a a big house. That must have belonged to to somebody、uh, who was very wealthy, because it was on the side of a hill, on the opposite side of Victoria Peak. So it wasn't in the snotty neighborhood, so to speak, but it was an undeveloped area. So we had the total hillside to ourselves, just to just for our house,、uh, and it was just wonderful. We would hike uh, uh, around the hillside, and we would sing songs. And, and you can imagine, with six kids, I'm the caboose, and, and we're singing. And I'm just really happy following my、uh, was my mother, who would lead these excursions. Several months after I was born, my dad had to go. To Incheon to check on a large shipment. He was the import export business that he had sent to Korea four days before the Korean War started. So he was there, and the war started. He joined the Korean War, but he joined the U.S. Marines. They gave him a field commission as a first lieutenant,、uh, and he was、uh, on the staff for. Uh, Chester Puller, who was at that point a colonel in the U.S. Marines, so my dad fought in the war. He he was a P.O.W. because he was captured.、Um, and, and the Chinese、uh, army did not like the fact that 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 he was a Korean with the U.S. Marines, and he was uh,、um, in fact sentenced、uh, for execution. But then he escaped. He comes back to Hong Kong. In the meantime, my mother had to kind of take care of us while he was gone, and and she became a very good dressmaker, and 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 she's a bit of a a merchant is the way I look at her. In fact, she had several dress dress shops in Hong Kong. Uh, and Hong Kong is divided into the island of Hong Kong and Kowloon, and there was a dress shop in, in 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 each of the commercial areas, and that's how she provided for for the family while my dad was gone, because my dad apparently lost all the wealth he had accumulated from from his business in that big shipment that, in in, in Incheon. So, having experienced going to China at nineteen, because he was also the second-born son, to make his fortune in China, and then to marry my mom, and then have to escape the communists when they came in, it was very clear to him that that when he looked at Hong Kong. And that they've just came to this sanctuary in Hong Kong.、Um, that 
1997, which is when Hong Kong was supposed to turn back to China, my doubt felt, felt that we may have to leave again, especially given the fact that he was a, a war prisoner on top of my, my grandfather's background as a, as a warlord. So the whole thing was not really conducive for us to stay in Hong Kong. We moved to the United States in 1958 and settled in a very rough part of Brooklyn, not knowing that it was going to be rough. All, all we knew was my parents saying that we were burning a lot of cash in a hotel in Manhattan and that we had to, you know, get out of the hotel and get to an apartment. It was hard to find an apartment that would fit eight people. And on top of that, my dad was a very, very deliberate thinker, felt that um, it's not good for us to move into an Asian ghetto, even though it would be very comfortable. So into Chinatown or, or wherever, a Korean enclave or whatever. And he felt that we needed to to look to successful immigrants in the United States. And the ones that he admired the most happened to be the Jewish immigrants. And of course, he had a lot of business dealings with Jewish companies. Um, and, and they were awfully nice to us when we moved to the United States. And one of the things that happened when we came was in 1958, there was a newspaper strike in Manhattan. And so all the newspapers stopped printing. And so there was no way to get real estate ads to, to see where we could go. And so the only papers available were the ethnic papers. So he would get the Jewish paper and bring it to his Jewish business friends and they would tell him where there might be apartments. And lo and behold, in this, in this Jewish immigration, immigrant neighborhood called Brownsville, there was an apartment that would allow us to have all six kids there. When I got to school was the first time we discovered why the apartments were available. The apartments were available because there had been a mass exodus of the Jewish immigrants out of that neighborhood into Queens and Long Island because they were not politically strong enough and New York City decided to put a lot of low-income housing in that neighborhood. It was a pretty tense time. I imagine the blacks were opposed, uh, oppressed by the whites, and and what they did was then they took it out on the Puerto Rican kids. Mm -hmm. And when when this little Asian kids shows up, I was I was an immediate uh, release for them, mm -hmm. and. So the Puerto Rican kids would make fun of me, and then the uh, black kid says, "Well, why, why, why should we let the Puerto, Puerto Rican kids have all the fun?" So then I have blacks and black kids and Puerto Rican kids gang up on me. So I was beat up a lot, and that was a not a happy time in my my life. the The fortune was that I didn't suffer any permanent damage psychologically or physically and made it through. Thus, some arrogance that if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere, which is, which is an incredible gift. And, and so that was a, a really good bit, bit of confidence that I developed in that. First of all, I wanted to be a CEO uh, ever since I was 14 after having been been overparented by my siblings. I, I wanted to be the boss. I didn't want to be bossed. It was only when I got to uh, college and then graduate school 
that I decided which industry that I wanted to be the boss in. I wanted to be the CEO of the most sophisticated hospital that I could, American hospital that I could. I was in such a hurry to become CEO because everybody was telling me that there are very few Asian American CEO to begin with, particularly of hospital, except in Hawaii where they wanted Asian CEOs, particularly Japanese uh, American CEOs. But they would accept, as, as when they recruited me, they would accept an Asian like me because I would blend in with the, with the Japanese uh, heritage there. So the best part of getting to be one of the few Asian American CEOs of an American hospital was that it was not just any hospital, it was a university hospital, a medical school hospital, which is uh, what me um, most sophisticated. I was the youngest CEO of a medical school hospital in the United States of any color, of any kind, which I liked, which was one of the reasons why I didn't go to Hawaii. I told the Hawaii headhunters that if they really want me to come, when the board decided that they, they just wanted to get the best CEO they could and not just um, an Asian American CEO, then they should come back and call me. So I was very happy to be um, able to compete with the en entire um, uh, market of available CEOs. My boss at my the hospital before that at Jefferson had become the vice president of the Health Science Center and he wanted me, but the challenges was that the hospital had lost money in 19 of the previous 20 years and had 22 different CEOs in that 20 years. Um, so they couldn't keep anybody or didn't want to keep everybody because the hospital was doing so poorly. But of course, I was so confident at this point, maybe it wasn't appropriate, but at that point, I was confident that I would be able to do it. And, and I jumped right into it. So it was very risky. It was a big risk. But I felt like that was my only chance to become CEO. Because if you, look, you can't get in the door, as my boss has said to me, said, you know, uh, you're competing against people who already have a track record. So I said, how do I be, get a track record? If, if, if no one will give me the chance to even develop a track record by taking the job because of my ethnic background. So, so I was very, very pleased with that opportunity. Uh, I was able to turn the hospital around, but as a, as a young person, a green, I was still learning and growing. And, and really, in some ways, if I wanted to be very honest about it, they should have tried to give it to somebody else, if they could find somebody who, who would give it to them. The Asian part of me, the Korean part, and the Chinese part, they are part of me. The only thing is that it's not the whole of me. I am first a person of the human race. If anything, I would say my identity is that I was a, a solid CEO. I'm very happy about that identity, that, that, that I did well with the community's resources to help uh, sustain the health of, of, of this community. So that's probably my truest identity is, is professional. My name is Michael Kantian Jin. This is my Korean American story.